Manchester United has a buyer, we think. Adidas has finally decided what to do with all those Yeezy shoes they weren't going to sell, and Peloton sinks even lower. It's Friday, May 12th. I'm senior writer Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Force Today. It seems the Manchester United sale is reaching the end. I say that tentatively because we've been following this one for I don't know how long anymore. And at some point, it felt like everything that looked like forward progress was actually just everything going in a giant circle. But it appears the loop has been broken. Reports are out that a preferred bidder has been selected. And that bidder, we think, is Ineos founder Jim Ratcliffe. That's according to The Sun. The key difference, it seems, was that Ratcliffe was okay with having Joel and Avram Glazer hang on to a minority stake in the team, while Sheikh Jassim, the other main bidder, wanted 100%. This also probably leaves room for private equity firms to own a piece of the team. If the Sun's reporting is accurate, we should have more details and some official statements in the next few days. As for Ratcliffe, he gets to own the team he rooted for as a kid growing up. All it took was starting a multi-billion dollar petrochemicals business. He should come in with a nice honeymoon period because fans hated the Glazers, and we'll see if the good feelings can last. Looking elsewhere, Adidas has chosen to sell its Yeezy branded merchandise and donate the proceeds with a focus on charities that have been hurt by the statements of Ye, formerly known as Kanye West. Quick review for anyone who thought that last sentence made zero sense. Adidas and Kanye had a very profitable partnership where they would sell his Yeezy branded shoes and he would get a cut. Then, late last year, Ye made a bunch of anti-Semitic comments on Twitter and other platforms, and Adidas ended its relationship with him. But that left them with around $1.3 billion in unsold Yeezy-branded inventory. They considered destroying it, rebranding it, donating it, but this week, they said they would sell it and donate the proceeds. This will probably help their bottom line. It will also probably help Ye's bottom line, because he still gets a cut here. So things are kind of ethically murky, But I don't know if there was a non-murky way out. Just as one example, if they had destroyed the merchandise, the financial hit from that could lead to some number of layoffs affecting people who had nothing to do with this. I'm not saying I know the right answer here. I'm saying I'm glad it's not my decision. But I'd rather be in Adidas' shoes than Peloton's. Peloton is recalling 2.16 million bikes because apparently the seat posts can unexpectedly break and hurt you. Their stock dropped about 9% on Thursday. On December 24th, 2020, you could buy one share of Peloton for $162.72. Today, you can buy one of those for $6.82. The graph of their stock price in their time as a public company now resembles a mountain range, including the part where the mountain goes back down to the ground, in this case at a lower elevation than where it started. And finally, quick update on the A's. They are still not committing to either of the sites in Las Vegas where they supposedly have a deal but they need to secure public funding in just over three weeks if they want to avoid lots of other moving parts. It seems to me like the time has come to pick something and run with it, but I guess we'll see if they are vindicated by the end result here. The process has been more than a little confusing. Up next, I spoke to Lanny Smith. Lanny had a brief NBA career, ended by an injury, and then became an entrepreneur. He founded the company Active Faith Sports in 2011, and then in 2020 founded Actively Black to fill what he saw as a lack of representation and investment in black communities by a lot of industries, but in this case, the fitness industry. We talked about that, of course, but we also got into what makes social movements happen, especially around issues that have been present for as long as anyone can remember, but suddenly become front and center in the cultural zeitgeist. We'll have that conversation right after this. Here's what's trending now. You can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months, 33,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. Everything they need to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity. Whether your business generates millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, take advantage of this special financing offer of no payments or interest for six months at netsuite.com slash frontoffice. That's netsuite.com slash frontoffice. All right, I'm joined now by the founder and CEO of Actively Black, Lanny Smith. Welcome, Lanny. Thank you for having me on. So let's just start real basic. What is Actively Black and why did you start it? Actively Black is a uh, Black-owned premium athleisure wear brand. Um, one of the only uh, Black-owned brands in this in this space, in this, in this industry. 
And uh, the, the reason for, for creating it was um, partly because of that lack of ownership um, in an industry that has profited from um, and benefited from black talent, black consumerism. But like I said, lacks lacks uh, uh, black ownership um, and and, you know, those same people in uh, decision making positions. And so um, after the murder of George Floyd, uh, saw a lot of these brands come out with declarations about what they were going to do for the black community. And, and honestly, it felt very performative. It felt like it was now part of their new marketing strategies and mainly because the events of 2020 outside of the pandemic um, were not new to the black community. You know, um, the, the police brutality, the racism, um, protesting those things, all these things have been um, an issue that the black community has been facing and dealing with for decades, even even centuries now. And so the timing of it where all these brands who never said anything about it before were now all of a sudden coming to the forefront with these declarations, it felt performative. And so I took the stance that, um, you know, it was time for us to stop asking for a seat at that table and to build our own table. So that was really the, um, the influence and uh, uh, the reason behind launching Actively Black. Yeah, I'm always interested in those moments when something that's been an issue forever, all of a sudden, um, you like a, a norm shift suddenly. And uh, yeah, I never know what to make of of companies like, you know, like the NFL got, you know, very um, vocal about their efforts. And so did any number like Nike and like even like JP Morgan Chase. And a lot of these, these companies put a lot of money behind what they're saying. But yeah, I, I'm always of two minds of those efforts where it's good that they're making the effort. But also, yeah, like you said, they're making the effort because it's in the the cultural zeitgeist all of a sudden in a way that it wasn't before, even though the reality is not actually different. Right. And and a lot of um, studies and articles are now coming out as people have been wanting to hold these corporations accountable for the pledges that they made and the declarations that they made. And what we have found now, three years later, is that the bulk of these promises that so many different corporations made have not actually been fulfilled, right? Um, you had the immediate, you know, hit and and there's the PR that comes from that, but the follow-up on that has already started to decline in, in, in at a fast pace. And so skepticism is not wrong, right? Because we're actually seeing that the results three years later, um, people haven't done what they said that they were going to do. Getting back to your company, uh, what was the response when when you launched Actively Black? This has been a snowball literally from day one. So I have this is the second brand um, that I have founded. The first brand is called Active Faith. Um, it's a faith based sports apparel brand that I launched back in 2010 after a knee injury ended my NBA career uh, really abruptly. Um, and the difference, um, man, it couldn't be more. It couldn't be more different. Uh, to give the the best example, we did a hundred thousand in revenue the first year of Active Faith, and I did the first hundred thousand in revenue the first two weeks of Actively Black. There was an immediate response, um, which a lot of people thought that it was just the uh, residual of twenty twenty and this. Uh, sudden awakening that it seemed like people had globally um, to buy black and to focus on promoting black owned businesses. Uh, but that it's proven not to be um, this one hit wonder thing of, of, of a timing coming off of 2020. It's literally just been this snowball since then. Um, so coming off of launch on Black Friday 2020, um, heading into February of, of 2021, we were the only black owned brand present at the Winter Olympics, we outfitted Team Nigeria. And out of 85 countries that participated at the Winter Olympics, um, our opening ceremony uh, uniforms were ranked number four, right? So you're you, so immediately, you know, you're on a global stage. Um, then you have, you know, the beginning of 2022, you have a, a photo go viral of, of former President Barack Obama wearing one of our products. Um, We've had a, um, a partnership with Marvel and Disney uh, where we were able to do a collaboration for Wakanda Forever, uh, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. So this thing has been something that literally took off immediately and um, has just grown at a pace that honestly, um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble keeping up with at the moment, but we're, we're doing some things to take care of that. And, and yeah, talk to me about the, the company itself. Um, what's it been like to, to try to scale up to meet the needs of, of this growing demand? Right. This is something I launched out of my apartment, right? And um, initially was filling orders and outsourced that so we could catch up with the volume that was happening. Um, we closed our Series A in May of, of 2022. Um, and with that, have been able to kind of ramp up production on inventory to kind of help meet demand. But even with that, we had an analytics company that came in and did an audit of our e-com site at the end of 2022. And they saw that we missed out on $8 million in revenue, um, just not having the adequate re- uh, adequate inventory to meet the, de- the growing demand. So um, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, process that's happening in real time. We're still experiencing some of these g- growing pains. Um, just onboarded some of our first hires. So this went from you know a, a solo thing out of my apartment to now we've got nine employees that we're onboarding to help kind of get on as soon as possible so that we can handle the scale and, and, and get to the next level. Thinking about the, the athleisure market, because you're, you know, you're an athleisure brand. Um, do, do you feel like you were filling a gap in that market that, that people were responding to? 100%. I mean, the athleisure industry, the athleisure segment of a pair of the apparel industry has been shooting straight up for seven years straight already, right? It was already the fastest growing segment of apparel. Then you have the pandemic hit and all of the lockdowns where everybody was wearing athleisure, right? Nobody was putting on slacks or jeans. So it just accelerated the growth of an industry that was already uh, growing so fast. But like I said, there has been a lack of representation from an ownership standpoint, um, as far as black ownership standpoint in this industry. And so um, being able to be one of the first in this premium athleisure wear market and be black owned and um, feature black models and 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 black creatives and being able to give back to the black community, that's something that hasn't existed in this space before. So um, we're seeing the audience respond to that in a way that um, reflects this this growth. You know, they're, they're excited about having something finally in this space that hasn't existed before. And your your company was started sort of with with an activist mindset, if if that's fair to say. Um, do you think now, when someone puts on an actively black hat or hoodie or whatever, um, do you think that's making a statement, or is it just are they just wearing their clothes? I guess I wouldn't categorize it as activism, more so um, purpose, right? Purpose. Um, and, 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 and meaning. So part of the, the goal for Actively Black is to encourage the Black community to get more um, active, right? Um, healthier in the way that we live, both physically um, and, and with our mental health. So that part is something that exists beyond activism, right? Now, obviously, there's an activism part of this. Um, but I think the main thing when people see Actively Black, one, the, the quality and the design is something that we have uh, heavily invested in because regardless of the message that you're carrying or the mission you're trying to carry out, if the product isn't good, nobody cares, right? And then to say that we are trying to compete in the same levels and the same places as the giants that exist, your Nikes, Lululemons, Adidas, the quality of the product has to be able to match up with that as well. So um, I think it's a combination of people seeing something that has a meaning and a message and also is a high quality product. Um, and the statement that's being made is less about the external statement and more so about an internal statement, right? The, the feedback that we're getting from the audience is, um, man, finally a brand that represents me. You know, I feel seen when I'm wearing this brand. I feel proud when I'm wearing this brand. So it's really more about the internal statement um, and how it's making people feel by wearing it rather than a statement that's made, that's being made to show somebody else. Uh, you alluded to a little bit of this earlier, but what are you looking forward to planning on uh, for you know the next, say, year or so? Yeah, right now, um, we're super focused on building out the, the internal systems and infrastructure to help us be able to, to scale, right? But the big picture vision for this is to um, be a global brand that, that 
continues to put mission and purpose first before um, before profit. Um, we already have um, so many people in, in different countries who have uh, been waiting on us to start shipping internationally, right? We've already got people on the continent in Africa uh, wearing the brand. And so to bring together the global diaspora, this isn't just African-Americans. This isn't just black people in America. This is a brand that we feel like can connect the um, the African diaspora across the globe. Um, so yeah, that th- those are my plans, man. I, I um, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for the other brands that are in this space. Um, Gymshark is one that I've kept my eye on because they're another brand similar to myself that was serving a niche audience, but was able to achieve this level of growth where now they're, you know, they're a $1.6 billion brand. That's a global brand. And Ben, Ben Francis started this out of his apartment. You know what I mean? And so, um, that's where I see actively black, uh, becoming, um, is, is becoming this global brand that continues to have this impact on the black community. All right, Laney Smith, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Man, thank you for having me. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, leave us a rating or review wherever you're listening. It takes 30 seconds. And I'll be really happy that you did. Thanks for listening. We will see you on Monday.